So the next session is going to be on liquid waste management, and it is going to be dealt with by Mr. Vinod Kumar KB. He is a consultant, FMS Rajagiri Hospital, Alva. Consultant and head VBG Consulting Engineers, Alva. And more than any of this, he is a very close friend of mine, and it's my honor and privilege to welcome him to deliver this session. I cannot think of a better person uh, other than probably Mr. Nathan sir here who could you know, do some justice to this really controversial topic. Uh, incidentally, this topic was not covered in our regional workshops, but we realized that in all the workshops, this was recurring as a constant query and we could not allay their doubts completely. So we have with us Mr. Vinod Kumar KB. He's a B Mechanical Engineering from PSG Institute of Technology, Coimbatore. Uh, with decades and decades of experience in the uh, field in healthcare man um, FMS management. He is a member and resource personnel for CAHO, certified quality implementer in hospitals with NABH, member of Ishraya Koshi chapter. And he has, uh, he is really particularly interested in the whole healthcare facility and he provides uh, consultancy, major projects in India, Middle East, uh, as well as. Uh, Colombo, Nairobi, the list goes on, frankly. So I invite Mr. Vinod Kumar KB to shed some light on this topic. Good afternoon, Dr. Deepthi. My voice is bad. I have a bad throat, but I will do my best to deliver. It's I know that won't stop you. <laughs> yes, yes, it's passion to take a, a class. Thank you, Dr. Deepthi, for that elaborate uh, explanation. And thanks to Kaho, Kaho Management, as well as uh, one good person here, Dr. Malanti, who has been uh, uh, along with me to come and take this uh, chapter. Thank you, Dr. Malanti, also. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the CQ series, uh, theme 22 on liquid waste management. My name is Vinod Kumar. Dr. Deepthi has given a brief description and uh, a description about my work profile. Now, um, I had not been also been listening to the other speakers in the morning sessions. It's all about waste management in the hospital. Now we have various kinds of waste, the solid waste, biomedical waste. Then we have liquid waste, we have e-waste, etc. Coming to the liquid waste management, generally it has to be treated. You need to treat it and the management goes through a plant, which we call it as a sewage treatment plant or an effluent treatment plant. So its majority is that the treatment has to be going through a process based on the kind of water that is being generated, the wastewater that is being generated. So we should know what kind of wastewater gets generated from a hospital. You have the wastewater coming from the flow drains to the wash basins and to the shower areas. It's called the salage, the gray water. And then we have the sewage, which is coming from your flushes and commodes. Uh, coming to the system, it's a large system. Obviously, it looks very large. It depends on the kind of uh, water, wastewater that's being generated from your organization, according to which the size of the, the treatment plant is designed for. There are various parameters that decide the kind of system that has to be decided, designed. Secondly, the uh, kind of water that comes into the treatment plant is also is important. So what are the different kinds of wastewater that comes in? The wastewater coming from the sewage, then we have wastewater coming from the flow drains and wash basins, etc. We have wastewater coming from the laboratory. We have centralized air conditioning systems in major healthcare facility where there is blowdown coming from the cooling towers, which is also a chemical waste water. Then we have wastewater coming from the canteen or the kitchen. So that has considerable amount of solid waste as well as uh, you know, oil and grease. So they need to be taken separately and brought into the main collection tank or the equalization tank of the treatment plant, for which we have a certain amount of preludes before they get into the equalization tank. This basically the thing is, what kind of system that you have enables the designer to design the right kind of a treatment plan for your hospital? Why? Because the kitchen wastewater depends on the kind of numbers that you, you generate in terms of food production per day, per meal. Similarly, the number of toilets that you have 
the the uh, waste chemical waste water coming from the cooling towers or the laundry depends on the facilities largeness and the number of one laundry machines which includes washers and washer washing this uh, washing machines as well as dryers then coming to the kitchen and also coming to the laboratory so based on that the system has to be designed the preludes have to be designed so that before these waters come into the main equalization tank for the treatment they have certain level of uh, uh, what do you call it a treatment where you stop all those major solids uh, stop the kind of oils that come in pre-treat the chemicals that is coming in from the wastewater before it enters the plant because generally these plants survive basically because of organisms that devour the waste material and in turn purifies the water as simple as that. So you can't have huge amount of chemicals flowing into a treatment plant which could actually spoil the quality of bacteria that grows in the aeration tanks and clarifiers and which then reduces the quality of water and you will not get the quality of water that is needed. The quality of water that is to be generated or the filtered out outlet water that comes out of your STP is generally decided by the CPCB or the state's pollution control board guidelines, where the parameters include the pH level, the TDS, the TSS, the BOD, COD, etc. We will go through all this in detail, but I just thought, uh, you know, these... Uh, depending on the kind of water, wastewater that is generated, depending on the kind of treated water that has to be brought out from the treatment plant, the design of the plant is decided by the consultants. In this treatment plant, we have three levels, the primary, secondary, and the tertiary. The primary is basically the pre-treatment that we call about. And this also is specifically mentioned as far as the biomedical waste Treatment Rules Guidelines 2016, which talks about pre-treatment for any, any hazardous chemicals that comes down to the water, waste water, before it enters the treatment stage into the uh, treatment plant, to the sewage treatment plant. So basically, you have to go for a pre-treatment, which is a neutralization or equalization or a precipitation, and then it enters the secondary part of the plant. The secondary part of the plant is where you have air aeration happening along with aerobic biological treatment along with settling in that. So a combination of aerobic treatment and settling clears the water of most of the waste and makes it ready for usage just before, just after your uh, filtration and disinfection process with sodium hypochlorite solution. So these three parts, the primary, secondary, and the tertiary, are important to any design of your sewage treatment plant. This is a page taken out of our Biomedical Waste Rule Guidelines 2016. The hospital wastewater is the, as I said, the sewage and sullage, and the toilet waste and the kitchen waste, all of these wastewater come into your STP. But when you have a chemical liquid waste, you basically have to have a pre-treatment for it, which we call it as a neutralization or a precipitation tank, which is then disinfected with a UV sterilizer, after which it enters the equalization tank of the main treatment plant. After the main uh, equalizing, after the uh, waters from the wastewater from your chemical liquid waste and the other wastewater enters the equalization tank, it starts with the primary process of clarification, then aeration, then a secondary clarification. In the secondary clarification process and in the aeration tanks, the sludge developed is to be again taken back to the equalization tank, which is carrying those you know, microorganisms as part of your treatment process. Once the sludge is taken, the extra sludge, which comes at the bottom of these clarifiers, they are taken out, out of these clarifiers and then it is dried in a sludge dryer and then used for manure or a fertilizer. At the other side, the treated water is then taken through 
two levels of filters, the sand filter and the carbon filter, activated carbon filter, followed by the disinfection process, after which it is ready to be discharged for usage, either as your irrigation purposes, or it can be used as a makeup water for the cooling towers, or it can be used in your flush tanks as well. But again, you need to be very sure about the kind of monitoring process that you have across the different stages of the water as the water passes through. And this can only happen if you have, like what Dr. Nathan said about online monitoring process with a manual check, check, checkpoints to see that the water quality is, made, is achieved at each stage of the process in the treatment plant. Otherwise, we will not be able to get the kind of quality treated water output from your treatment plant. Sewage, let's go into the depth of the plant design and uh, how the process works through, finally uh, allowing you to achieve that treated water that you can reuse. Sewage is basically the wastewater that is a combination of solid and liquid excreta. And silage is the wastewater that doesn't contain excreta. It's the wastewater coming from your wash basins, kitchens, as well as your bathroom floor drain. So this is a kind of the ter terminology, sewage and silage is the terminology that we use in, in such treatment plants. Sewage composite, the composition of sewage generally is 99.9% .9 of water, and it has 0.1 percentage of organic and inorganic solid of which there's most of the content is basically millions of equally available in the sewage. So you can understand the kind of waste that is being generated is so hazardous that we need to treat them. And treating them has to be uh, you know, mandatorily in line with the water quality that the PCB demands at the output of your STP or ETP. Same time, the the quantity of wastewater that is coming from the building into the treatment plant. Actual decomposition of these organic matters, which comes in the uh, wastewater, is generally happening in two basic processes, the aerobic process and the anaerobic process. The simple difference is the aerobic process utilizes oxygen and the anaerobic process does not use oxygen. In the aerobic process, in the presence of oxygen, organic matter is actually broken down into CO2, water, ammonia, nitrites, nitrates, and sulfates by the action of bacterial action, including fungi, as well as protozoa. So you can see that a combination of oxygen, air, air and oxygen, along with bacterial action, start, begins the decomposition process in this process called as the aerobic system. In the anaerobic system, it decomposes the organic waste without the use of oxygen into gases called as methane, ammonia, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen. What happens is most of the designers, uh, I mean, in fact, if you look at olden designs, the STP has a combination of both anaerobic and aerobic process. But again, it depends on the kind of volume that is being generated and to create the kind of uh, slow process of you know uh, settlement treatment disinfection and then usage of the treated water so according to that this process is actually designed for that in that system where you generally have anaerobic and a combination of anaerobic with aerobic process here is where the decomposition happens so the basic aim of this plant, is, as I said, is to stabilize the organic matters so that you can safely dispose it at an acceptable standard of purity. So the parameters or the indicator that is generally the standard test that is being followed is the BOD. It's an indicator of the organic content of the sewage and that is the biochemical oxygen demand. So the testing of your treated water, basically, as I said earlier, the pH levels, the total dissolved solids, total suspended solids, BOD and COD. So BOD is defined basically as the amount of oxygen 
absorbed by a sample of sewage during the specified period, generally it is three to five days at a specific temperature by this living organism. I will go through the process, what the general PCB guidelines ask for, what are the levels that are acceptable. But it's important to know what BOD is and why BOD has to be monitored as part of your mandatory requirements as per the guidelines by the CPCB or the State Pollution Control Board. For natural water, the OD value is around one milligram per liter, whereas for an untreated sewage is as high as 300 milligrams per liter. So you need to bring that below 30. This 300 and above the OD value generally has to be treated and brought down below 30 as per the Pollution Control Board guidelines. But if you're going to reuse the water, then you need to have further treatment process. I did talk about the sand filter, activated carbon filter. We have to add on an ultra filtration because of which the, the water BOD levels comes below or closer to three milligrams per liter, which is as good as usable for your drinking purposes. So that's the level of BOD that has to be maintained or obtained after the treatment happens when the water passes through your sewage treatment plant. When it comes to chemical-based uh, or water laden with chemical, the COD is also important because the COD part, and uh, there, are, there are organizations which have two kinds of treatment plants, which I forgot to tell you in the beginning, a sewage treatment plant and an effluent treatment plant. But the standards des doesn't specifically say that you need to have an effluent treatment plant. It just says that you need to have a pre-treatment of the chemical laden water before it gets into the STP. But in projects or in, in HCF, huge uh, facilities where the water quality, water quantity is larger, and that is decided by the kind of water that is coming into the STP and what quality it has before it is treated. So that quality of water decides the requirement of an ATP in addition to an STP. Because the ATP, the, the effluent water coming from large air conditioning plants, coming from large uh, laundry setup, large, uh, what do you call it, uh, production of water, which is laden with more chemicals, decides that you need to go for an <clears throat> effluent treatment plant or in short called as an ATP. So in such cases, along with the BOD, you also have to have an indicator which is called as the COD, the chemical oxygen demand. It's a test that measures the amount of oxygen required to chemically oxidize the organic material and inorganic nutrients which is present in the water. After the treatment in the ATP, then the water can be taken back into the equalization tank of the STP and you follow the process in the STP so that you don't damage or disintegrate the bioorganisms that are thriving in the aerobic tanks, which generally decompose the waste. So the amount of, the amount of chemicals that is present in huge amount of water coming from uh, the uh, from the laundries or the cooling tower uh, blowdowns are mandatory to be understood before you decide whether you just have a small pretreatment plant or you need to look at a larger pretreatment plant, which is generally the ATP. And the permissible limit of the COD is between at least less than 500 ppm. A schematic of a process is like this. The raw sewage comes in and then you have various systems. As I mentioned before, you need to have a screen where, where you stop all the larger solid particles, solid, or solid <clears throat> materials that come in through the water. As such, we have been seeing, you know, the babies, diapers coming through them, plastics, gloves, um, what do you call it? Um, napkins, various kinds of uh, solid obstacles get passed through the pipelines and come to the STP, but they cannot be treated as you know that. So you need to separate all those solids that come in through the water, which is either through the sewage water, sewage water lines. So in a hospital of a large nature or a smaller nature, 
all the toilets are generally connected through pipelines and through manholes and through a line of distribution network, it comes into the STP. So at each of these points where solids are possible to be dumped into the STP, into the sewage system, it is mandatory to have a bar screen. And then you have a grid chamber followed by the primary settling, and then we go into the aeration tank. The settling process is where you allow to settle larger uh, suspended particles, and then the, the top level of these uh, primary settling tanks, the clear water will be moving, taken up at the top level and moved into the aeration tank. In the aeration tank, you have you know, pipe, pipe, piped, pipe, uh, piped air coming into the water, air being put into the pipelines through blowers kept at close locations to the aeration tanks, after which it goes into secondary settling and then you go into the disinfection process. To make it more clear, you can look at this. You can see the sewage coming in from the hospital. As I said, you need to have bar screens and the grid chamber where the larger solid items are being separated out of the wastewater. So that takes care of the preliminary stage. The primary stage is the next level of uh, you know, uh, settlement, which is the clarifiers, and then comes into the aeration tank, which I just told you about, where air is being blown into the system along with microorganisms through media that are put into those aeration tanks, which helps the decomposition of those organic matter. Subsequent to the movement of uh, the uh, subsequent to the decomposition in the aeration tax, it moves into the second clarifier and then the filtration process. In all these tanks, basically, there's quite an amount of sludge that will come in, but we cannot throw away all the sludge. We need the sludge process to be recycled into the aeration tank to help the microorganisms to grow in the media that they have been inserted into the tanks. Now, the rest of the sludge then which are settling down at the bottom of the primary and secondary clarifiers are taken to the sludge digestion tank after which it is dry and then, then sent for uh, usage as a fertilizer. Let's move into more details. This, this is what I told about the screening part of it, the bar screens. All the large floating objectives that which includes all kinds of plastic material, rags, goods, etc. they get trapped here at the first one because they cannot be treated in the STP. Then comes the grid chamber. After the solid particles like your gloves and napkins, diapers, um, what do you call it, caps, these are all the general things that get dumped into the system. It's very unfortunate. We have, I know, educated uh, staff with us, but uh, there are people who come and stay with us who still have the habit of dumping everything down the commode and clicking on the flush, it goes down the flush into the STP. So the grid chamber is the one that will have a kind of a, a network where the it's about, you know, where you, you are able to uh, stop the water or have a flow in the, in the, the velocity. I, I'm trying to say the velocity is about one feet one foot per second. So we have a kind of slow moving water in the grid chamber. It's a narrow chamber. And this allows still, I mean, I mean, there will be still heavier uh, uh, solids or uh, obstacles, heavier uh, solids coming along with the water, which uh, would have passed through the bar screen because bar screen is having a net for larger of uh, heavier, uh, heavier solids. So this grid chamber will have a slow flowing velocity in them, wherein which you are allowing the water to go very slow. And because of the slow process of its movement, it allows some more solids to get collected at the bottom of the chamber. And these grid chambers are having outlets at the bottom, which are normally in a closed position. And during the cleaning stages, they are opened up to remove the solids that are collected at the bottom according to the you know the periodicity is made it's decide, decide, uh, designed by the users basically considering the amount of solids that gets accumulated there 
the top level in the grid chamber, the water again becomes more lighter because the solids have started settling down and then it moves into the primary sedimentation process. Here, the primary sedimentation tank is a tank. It's a large rectangular tank. Here again, the flow rate is maintained very, very slowly. Again, one to two feet per minute. And the tank size is determined based on the volume of flow that comes into the tank. And considering the flow rate, we know what size the tank has to be made up of. Here, 50 to 70% solids will settle down because of the gravity. Because of the gravity, the solids will start settling down. Again, uh, we have the sludge which is getting at the bottom portion that needs to be uh, removed at regular intervals. And at the top level of the water, you have a scum that gets uh, need to be also removed. So the clear water, the top layer will be the scum. The bottom will be this organic solids, heavy solids, which have settled down due to gravity. In between these two, the water, which is moving slowly at close to two feet per minute, gets into the next level, which is the secondary sedimentation process, which is the aerobic oxidation, which is the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, where you use oxygen and media, which contains these microorganisms, which helps into the uh, in decomposition uh, in the, of the uh, organic matter coming in with the liquid base. So the effluent from the primary sedimentation tank, which is then, uh, which, which contains a proportion of uh, organic matter in solution and numerous living organisms. So it has high oxygen demand and subject to this aerobic oxidation, we use, we, we, we help the, the organisms to decompose the organic matter there. Now, the processes that we generally use is the actuated sludge process where you use aeration and the subject in time, the, sub, the, the subjective time is approximately six to eight hours of aeration. We man mechanically use or you use forced compressed air continuously from the bottom to the top of the tank. And the air gets bubbled up to the, so that you get this aeration happening throughout the process as the water moves, as which has moved into this particular tank. And as a part of it, the organic matter gets oxidized because of the oxygen content in the air that has been continuously put into from the bottom of the aeration tank. And the, the organic matter gets oxidized into CO2, nitrates and water with the help of the bacteria that is already there in the media that is put into the aeration tank. So the two factors, the bacteria, aerobic bacteria, and the presence of forced air or compressed, forced compressed air helps the you know, uh, aeration process in the chamber here. <clears throat> After this, then the uh, is basically to disinfect uh, any inactive pathogens in the water that is coming out. You can use uh, free chlorine or combined chlorine, or you can have a UV method or ozone method or a chlorine dioxide system. Generally, we use the UV or a hypochlorite solution. Disinfect. You have a chemical dosing system where the solution is put into base depending on the quantum of water that is coming in, because this basically is treat this. This is the pre-treatment uh, process of uh, the uh, wastewater after your uh, aeration happens. So here, after this disinfection happens, you take it through the two levels of filters. So here, what is important is the chemical disinfection and filtration helps you to actually handle, uh, I'll, I'll come, come back to the screen again. If you look at this particular uh, main map of the, uh, the plant, after the, uh, uh, the clarifiers or the aeration tank, you have the clarifiers here. Again, there is uh, what you call it media, which is kept in and then, the uh, slow process of water going through that and any further organic material available will also be trapped and then it comes into the filter feed tank. In the filter feed tank, you have to have uh, the chemical dosing, which I mentioned, which disinfects or does the process of disinfection, after which any kind of solid materials are trapped in two levels of filtration, which is the sand filter and then the activated carbon filter. These are all pressurized filters, so you have to pump the water. So the treated water that is coming after your aeration tank and after your clarifiers, 
are to be first filled into a filter feed tank where the chlorine dosing happens. And after the chlorine dosing is complete, the pumps pull the water from the tank and pushes it through these two levels of filters, which is the pressurized sand filter and the activated carbon filter. Post this, the water comes into the final storage tank. Again, depending upon the quality of water and the reusage, uh, ultrafiltration is also suggested, which is what I'm going to tell you next. Ultrafiltration, ultra, sorry, sorry for my bad voice. Ultrafiltration is another treatment process which you follow after your uh, pressurized sand filter and activated carbon filter, which uses a hollow fiber or a sheet membrane to mechanically filter the water which contains even minute smaller particulates. And again, the ultrafiltration, you know, it uses to particulate down out to 0 0.025 microns. So this is what is important part of it. But unfortunately, if the water has, if the water quality contains the salt solids, then the ultrafiltration unit cannot take care of or filter the dissolved particulates for which you will need an RO plant. So again, the whole process of uh, the filtration generally stops with the, uh, the sand filter, carbon filter, and then to bring the uh, BOD levels closer to three, ultrafiltration is always recommended. But if you have to, uh, the so dissolved solution, uh, dissolved particles more as more than the you know, content as per the approval required by the PCB guidelines, you will need to insert uh, our plant as well, so that before you utilize the treated water for your various systems. As I said, the treated water basically gets into uh, usage either for irrigation or landscaping. It is also used for the cooling towers uh, where the water is needed as a makeup for the towers which have a lot of losses of water during evaporation and drift losses. So this cooling tower and the chillers that maintain the conditioning plant of the building needs water at a uh, higher level of quality where an RO plant may be needed. So that decision will be taken up based on the quality of water that comes out of your STP. So it depends on the kind of water that enters the STP. So basically, if you have to reuse the water and then if the TDS is also higher, then, then the use of RO plant is mandatory. Otherwise, if you're just going to use it only for landscaping or gardening, etc., you can uh, you can take the water out of your ultrafiltration system and then utilize the water for such requirements. As, as such, you, you get in a lot of sludge that is a part of a waste that is a solid waste coming out from the the different stages of uh, settlement in the STP or ETP, which needs to be actually taken out at various intervals, depending upon the sludge formation in your plant. And then you dry them in a sludge drying bed. This digested sludge is then utilized in the form of a fertilizer for agriculture purposes. Now look at a sample that we took in the last month. In this month, uh, apparently in, on 4th of September, the sample of the water taken out from the STP, this is uh, at Rajagiri Hospital, Cochin. You can see the first column talks about Kerala State Pollution Control Board limits. And the last column talks about the actual quality of water that was tested from the uh, treated water that was coming out of the STP. The pH level uh, is generally acceptable between 5.5 and 9. And the uh, actual actual value was 7.32. Now look at the other major part. TDS is acceptable up to 2100 as long as you're going to use it for your landscaping or irrigation. Uh, here the actual value obtained was 736. But as I mentioned before, if you want to use this treated water for cooling tower makeup or any other equipment processes, then this TDS has to be brought in the range of 200 to 300, for which, as I said, you need to have an RO plant. So the design of the RO plant and the usage of the water in the building, as I said, the usage of treated water is primarily used for landscaping, et cetera. 
if you don't have, do not have much of a landscaping area the process is that you can connect the you can discharge the wastewater into the city mains because you are within the limits but recycle reuse recycle is the process that we follow in green technology so we need to make it use of the uh, what you call recycled water so how do you make uh, reuse them how do you reuse the recycled water one is for landscape as i said if your landscape is less you can use them for your flushing purposes so the flushing purposes this kind of water is usable but if you're going to utilize it for your cooling towers or any other equipment treatment processes then you need to bring down the uh, tds below or uh, closer to 200 you can see the tss the total suspended solids is uh, acceptable limits is up to 100 and the actual value is 27 BOD is another important factor, biochemical oxygen demand, which is mandatory as part of the STP's treat, treated water testing. It's supposed to be 30 and below, and uh, the achieved BOD level is 6. COD level, the chemical oxygen demand level, maximum limit is 250, and achieved is 48. Oil and grease is another important uh, parameter that is generally being tested as per the parameters issued by KSPCB or the Pollution Control Board is not to exceed beyond 10, it's a 2. So one thing I did forget to mention is when the kitchen wastewater comes into the STP, you need to have like a bar screen uh, for the STP uh, sewage coming from the toilets. You need to have a bar screen and a grease interceptor, oil interceptor, as, a, as a, uh, an in addition to the uh, if you look at this particular, the first screen, you will know that. You can see uh, on the left side, the wastewater inlet coming from the canteen. It has got a grid chamber and it has got a collection pit as well. And then after that, there is an oil separator, after which only it comes into the STP. So you can see that you are actually, because you know, a lot of rice and basic uh, kind of small kinds of vegetables get into the tank, which cannot be treated and they become, uh, you know, very nastily smelling when they get uh, stuck in the tanks because, as you see, we have a lot of settling tanks in the initial process in the equalization and reactors, and then you come into the aeration tank. So, in the initial process of the treatment, it's more of settling. And when you have, when you don't have grid chambers or when you don't have oil separators, they become detrimental and they become a problem to the actual treatment of the wastewater through the uh, aerobic system. So obviously, you need to have a, a filtration process, a grid chamber, a collection tank, again for collecting uh, solids which are which get down by gravity, and the top level contains oil. Oil always keeps floating in the water that is coming from the kitchen, though sometimes it dissolves with the material. But then as you have a slow flow in the collection pit and then comes into the oil separator where the oil is separated, it's a grease or oil separator. So by this process, you don't bring in unwanted oil or grease into the uh, main STP as a result of which you're going to safeguard your treatment process. This treatment process will only be safeguarded the moment uh, will be safeguarded only as long as you are able to trap the basic solids and oil coming from the kitchen waste as well. So you need to maintain below 10 as far as the oil and grease is concerned. So this is, I thought about showing this particular treatment, sorry, the test report, which actually says that you need to, uh, you know, uh, uh, have a proper system, a system designed preliminarily, uh, primarily on the process that kind of water quality that you generate, the quantum of water that you generate, and the process of expansion, the process of demolition, the process of adding new services, all these have to be looked at primarily before you decide the, the or before you design the STP or the ETP of the uh, treatment plant. Because uh, if you say that you have a hospital which is uh, 300 bedded. The standards talk about 450 liters per patient per day, subject to not having a laundry or a kitchen. But if you have an in-house laundry or kitchen, that 450 liters per patient per day increases to close to 750 liters per patient per day. So 
300 uh, beds into 750 liters per patient is the water that you need for the building. And whatever water that you pump as filtered water for the building's usage comes back into your sewage treatment plant for treatment. So you can imagine how big the treatment plant has to be. It all depends upon the kind of uh, the use, the, the, the bed strength, the strength of your kitchen, the CSSD, the strength of your laundry, the strength of your laboratory. All those generate a lot, lot of liquid waste, which finally comes into this plant. Now, it's important that you design it primarily correctly so that you do not have to go for a shutdown. I mean, a shutdown of an STP or ATP itself is a major challenge for a hospital because if you do not treat the water, you cannot discharge it into the main city drains or any pond or river close by because it's going to be contaminating the uh, whole rivers or the, or the city main because we carry a lot of biomedical waste and it's going to be very dangerous for the healthy people living in and around the hospital or for the society as such. So this particular uh, process of selecting and designing the right treatment plant and maintaining it on a 24 by seven process. And as Mr. Nathan mentioned with online monitoring process, you will actually know the kind of pH levels that uh, the water quality levels at the different stages in the process itself. And by distant monitoring, you will be able to find out if there is a problem in any particular area or segment of the treatment plant so that you can take action correctly. Also, it's important to build your treatment plant in such a way that the cleaning of the tanks, removal of unwanted sludges actually helps you to get a good quality of water coming out from the treatment plant. So the design aspect is very, very important as far as the, uh, the treatment plant is concerned. The guidelines as such, we use the guidelines, uh, the Bio Biomedical Waste Management Rules 2016 and the UNDP WHO's uh, management of healthcare waste water as far as the design of these treatment plants are concerned. Any questions? Thank you so much, Vinod, sir, for exhaustively covering the sessions. And I can see uh, he, I can hear that your voice was uh, breaking in between. So thank you so much for going the extra mile to deliver the session, even amidst that. So uh, we have a few queries. Uh, can we take five minutes to answer those? Some of those. Yes, doctor. And as I said. Uh, as you told in the initial stages also, more questions come up during the panel discussions. Uh, I'm available on the phone or uh, we can communicate with the answers later on. So uh, just a few questions which have uh, been recurring throughout the day yeah. is regarding uh, Mr. Afan Rain has raised a question whether less than 10 bedded hospitals also need to put ETP or STP for liquid waste. Um, it's a difficult question to answer. When you have beds, obviously you cannot have wastewater coming from a hospital which has got a bedded facility without pre-treating. Uh, you cannot dispose it to the main drain. So uh, if you would like to, uh, the biomedical waste guidelines also tells that if you have a bedded facility, and unlike a, a clinic like which is a daycare, uh, you will be generating wastewater coming from the toilets and it, they have to be treated. So the other spectrum of the same question is, is it mandatory to have ETP in a 600 bedded hospital, which I think you have covered in the single answer. It has to be done because uh, for a 600 bedded, obviously you will generate close to one and a half lakh liters of water coming, which is full of chemicals, chemical laden, and you cannot put it into the STP directly. So you need to have a, have a pre-treatment or a precipitation uh, before you take it into the STP, and then it goes through the uh, treatment process in the STP. So you need to generally have a larger plant. Obviously, you call it as an ETP. So another question from uh, Mayuri S is whether aldehyde, like formaldehyde, needs to be neutralized, Obviously, probably from yes. the laboratory perspective. Yes. Yeah, yeah, the laboratory has to be neutralized. Yes. It, it is going to be uh, disastrous in the STP if it goes directly. Yes. So the, the, what happens is, Dr. Deepthi is, the pipelines that are generally laid in the hospital are all interconnected. Mm. Because the, uh, initially when the building is built, the lab is not, the location of the lab is not being decided. 
the location of the laundry is not decided. Location mm -hmm. of all the chemical waste generating points are not decided. It all just, just gets connected to your sewage treatment line. That's where it becomes a challenge for hospitals. So it is always important that, you know, the guidelines are very clear. You cannot take it into the STP directly without your pre-treatment. So any auditor or any data, you have to show that, you know, you have a pre-treatment of the wastewater coming from the laboratories or the laundries. Because, so the, uh, the, the design of the pipeline has to be set right so that you have a precipitation process done prior to the water coming into the main sewage treatment lines. I think the role of microbes in this thing has not been portrayed adequately. That is why the question arises whether we can push in for a little cause havoc and yeah. the system will... The whole the system will fail. Your STP yeah. will fail and you will not have a, any other place to drain off this uh, yes. contaminated waste, a liquid waste. So it becomes a disastrous uh, for the hospital. Yes, Dr. Shashang, you want to add something? Yeah, I think uh, about the aldehyde disposable, I mean, I think we all know very clearly that all aldehydes, whether it's formaldehyde, glutaraldehyde, or orthothaldehyde, all are carcinogenic agents, and uh, they are causing a big problem when it gets uh, not treated and sent out in the waste. So when it comes to formaldehyde, glutaraldehyde, uh, there are very clear guidelines, uh, you know, in terms of how you got to dispose them. But with orthophthaldehyde, which is also common as OPA, which is currently quite popular in a lot of scopy units, is that uh, uh, the company itself specifies that it has to be neutralized uh, before you can discard it. Uh, in fact, if you don't discard it, actually it leaves uh, colored patches in your you know, uh, wash basins and sinks and bathrooms and other places. So that is something you have to keep in mind before you even send it out to the ETP or STP over here. Adding on to what Dr. Shashank says, uh, histopathology also uses huge amount of formaldehydes. Yeah, I, I think it's it's from the laboratory perspective that the question arose. Yeah, yeah, uh, right. Either we have a lot of uh, laboratory fraternity in our participants or all the queries are purely, you know, pertaining to the laboratory. Because we have another query from Dr. Surya Tiwari, how to treat the liquid based of laboratory analyzers. What, what does it come to that? Shashank, can you help me out with the chemicals coming out from there? I think uh, these are more of uh, chemicals, less uh, in terms of uh, toxic, uh, these things like unlike disinfectants and other things, but it's yeah. more of chemical waste that is there. So I think with your regular uh, ETP treatment that is there, I think chemical treatment that should take care of, unless there is a chemical that is specifically uh, mentioned by the manufacturer saying that it needs a special treatment. Otherwise, uh, most of them follow standard chemical uh, Degradation. These are Degradation. basically uh, reagents, not very yeah. uh, you know caustic or uh, corrosive, but uh, they will be coming across or they will be generated as part of interaction with the serum or the body fluid. So it becomes a biomedical waste more than a chemical per se. So uh, like Dr. Shashank and um, Vinod sir said, it would be a biomedical waste, but has a chemical element to it. So eat it. Yeah. So, um, that, yeah. Sorry, Dr. Deepthi. Uh, so we'll have to keep in mind that when we're talking about liquid biomedical waste, if there are chemicals involved, you also have to make sure that you are compliant to the Hazardous Chemical Act of, I think, 1980s or something. It's there, I think, 1984. So I think that also will add on. So keep both of those in mind because, as I said, you know, both of them are uh, regulatory perspectives. These are legal requirements. So one has to be a little careful among these. The whole process starts with the hospitals having a, a dedicated hazmat inventory, and then uh, you start identifying what type of chemicals you use. And the, the suppliers actually provide us with the data, which helps us to actually even design the ETP correctly. Many places that is not taken up clearly. So obviously uh, having a clear data on what chemicals being used or even analyzes that what the question was, it helps the uh, process of uh, you know precipitation easier. So uh, take home from this is another important take home from this is you cannot you know completely segregate hazmat biomedical waste separately. It all has to get integrated and there has to be clarity because every decision matters on the chemical nature of the chemical involved also. So one last question from Richa T. Uh, what should be the frequency of checking BOD and COD of treated fluids? 
the water quality test reports uh, generally follow a monthly cycle for the STPs and ETPs. So they need to follow that way. And in case they get into some issue somewhere, then I think uh, we need to quickly do a water test because BOD, COD generally takes three to five days for us to get a clear report because that's a time when the process happens in the treatment uh, in the laboratory before you get at the at, at least on the fifth day or the fourth day only you'll get the report. So. Uh, what happens is like, you know, uh, like calibrating your HEPA filters. You do it once in a year and then you get a HAI, then you feel that HEPA has to be changed. So it's six monthly what we do. Here again, the earlier you do, it's better. So monthly process is generally the frequency being followed in terms of checking the quality of the treated water coming out of the treatment plant. So and that... as far as the pollution control board is concerned, I made a note that Form 4 has to be submitted uh, by before July of every year for the uh, the preceding calendar year, which where you all these data have to be inputted, and you also have to attach the data of your monthly testing water testing quality data uh, as part of the attachments, which be which gets submitted along with form four. So there you have, uh, Richard. Uh, uh, only then uh, see when when they give you the consent to operate. Uh, it's the it's the stand it's a document that like fire NOC it's a consent to operate is a document that helps you to operate uh, you know uh, STP or an ETP so your mandatory uh, it's a mandatory documentation process so you will have to test it on a monthly basis collect all the twelve of them and bef they be before the next July you need to submit them officially as part of form four submissions. So there you have it. The Can question just is very one precise. more question I think this. <laughs> Came up. This is regarding nuclear waste uh, that is there coming from nuclear medicine departments. I think uh, uh, we had to be very clear over here that uh, uh, the AERB guidelines of 1987 supersedes all other, uh, you know, biomedical waste disposal over here. So uh, I have left a link in the chat box. Uh, kindly click on that. That's the AERB link for all the acts and regulations. So whenever you're dealing with nuclear medicine waste, either a, in a hospital or nowadays we have a lot of independent nuclear medicine facilities. So uh, all regulations of waste disposal, both liquid and solid, will be followed as per those regulations. Yeah. Uh, I regard to Dr. Shashank, actually, uh, when you use iodine therapy as part of the nuclear medicine, depending on the half life period of those radioactive materials, the wastewater coming from those uh, toilets where the patients use, the way liquid waste coming out has to be uh, kept in a delay tank. Now, the delay tanks are designed for a period of at least 80 to 90 days of storage, before which you pre-treat them and then either drain it to the common drains or you can take it into the STP. Again, you have to strictly follow the ARB guidelines like what uh, Dr. Shashank mentioned. So the design of the infrastructure is primarily important when you uh, take care of the liquid waste coming from treatment centers where nuclear medicine has been used as into the patients. They, these toilets are basically called as radioactive or active toilets. And the pipelines hot, are again... Uh, pardon? Hot toilets. Hot labs and oh. active toilets. Hot labs where the medicines are being prepared and toilets where these uh, radiating patients use them. And those pipelines are hot lines which need to be encased in concrete or not near people moving around. And then this gets into the treatment tank, the what do you call it, delay tanks. The big two delay tanks so that you know you can store them for 90 days before the, you can put the connection into the other one. It, it's a whole process by itself. I think that needs more than an hour to uh, explain yes. on the wastewater coming from nuclear medicine areas. So basically where radioactive waste is concerned, for it to be treated as biomedical waste also, we have to wait for the half-life. That is the, the whole thing if you want to put it in a very simple term. It is biomedical waste, for, but for it to be treated like any other biomedical waste, we have to wait for its radioactivity to decay. The decay exactly. period has to be held. Perfect. So anyway, th there are a lot of guidelines. Biomedical waste guidelines 2016 is the one around which everything else revolves. There are a lot of planets and subplanets around it. So the regulatory framework will be taken up as a separate session, a lot of which will be covered in this, in that session. So uh, thank you so much, Vinod sir. Vinod sir has agreed that he will be taking on questions. Anything that is pending, he'll be taking on eventually because he's one of our panelists also. So uh, with that, uh, thank you so much, Vinod sir, for sparing the time during a busy working day in your busy schedule. It was a very enlightening session and something that has cleared a lot of queries. There were a lot more queries, but many of them were addressed during your session, so I didn't take it up. 
So thank you so much. Uh, with that, maybe we can move on to the next Let one. Let me thank um, you both. Yeah.